Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. Nice to see you all. This is a bit special now. We're going to take you to deepest, darkest Devon, to uh, Curtis Pitt's Game Larder. Um, so we've been working with Curtis now um, since October, end of October. About then. Um, about then. And in that time, we've been on a bit of a whirlwind. Um, just, you know, we are food marketing consultants, and so Curtis has invested in a brand new game larder to take his business onto the next level. Um, and he's seen, you know, demand for his product soar. So we needed a bigger facility. Um, and so we're going to give you a little tour of the larder today. Um, talk you through Curtis, his fantastic wild and parkland venison that he manages. Um, and also meet Annette uh, Alcock from Taste of Game. Who we've also been working with recently. Um, so Taste of Game is an initiative to encourage people to eat more game meat. It's wild, it's good for you, it's versatile, and you would have been seeing us talking about the various different recipes that um, chefs like Hayden Groves, who was in the previous call, uh, Michael Nazero, um, Charlotte Vincent, Ellie Wentworth, have all been working with Curtis to showcase just how wonderful the various different cuts are. We saw Paul de Costa Greaves in the Copper Crest um, demo. He's actually showcasing Curtis's partridge this month as well in his uh, Copper Crest goodie box. You can see all of our suppliers work together, nut sellers, whoever was on the nut sellers um, call as well. Nut sellers, macadamia go extremely well with venison. And we're just talking to our lovely honey lady this morning. Um, we found out as well that honey goes really well with venison, uh, cracked black pepper, a bit of juniper. So you might see some very interesting recipes um, being published on the Chef's Forum site and indeed Curtis's new website that's launching on the 1st of February. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Curtis and let him welcome you to the larder. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Devon and welcome to our dear larder that's situated in mid-Devon. This is where we bring back all our wild and parkland carcasses and we're currently in our inspection room. This is the first initial room where our wild and our parkland carcasses come back fully intact in the coat, in the fur, and they get inspected in here for all, all sorts of different um, things that we need to look at before they then go through into the first chiller, which is what we call our in-fur chiller. And we prep all our animals are then aged and hung in that chiller for the desired time. This completely can be down to the chef's, chef's requirements. And it can also be down to our, our, our own ability for retail and what we do for, for all aspects of our different products we produce here in the larder. Um, our, even our fur from the rabbits and all of that side of stuff go in there as well. And then once they've finished in their aging for whichever time is required, they come back out into this room here. And this is the room where we skin our carcasses um, and then inspect them again before they go through into our what we call our clean chiller where they're, they're, they're skinned and ready to be cut to order or even in some cases go out whole to different wholesalers and food, fruit, food houses from that point of view. Um, today we're going to talk you through a little bit about how, how the larder flows and how the larder works and where our carcasses come from. The first carcass we're going to look at this morning is a wild, it's a wild fallow carcass. It was harvested within 25 miles of the larder here in Devon, so it's relatively local. We, we do harvest most of our carcasses from within Devon. Um, and this fallow carcass was, was harvested last week um, out in the wild. It's been in the chiller for the last seven days, and it's now going to come out, and it's going to be cut for orders going out this weekend. So we're going to show you a little bit about the process of skinning the carcass, taking it through into our processing room, you guys seeing the different cuts we can produce and I'll, I'll break the carcass down into primals. Primal sections are your haunches, your saddle, um, your shoulders, you know, the main cuts you guys as chefs use. Um, and then we're going to break down a haunch into um, the six ounce steaks that you guys have hopefully all received in your sample boxes. I believe we're now going to hear from Annette. Annette, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Fantastic. 
Right, okay. So I'm going to share my screen. I've got a little uh, presentation. Um, I can find it. There it is. Right. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Perfect. That's good. Okay. So, um, as uh, Catherine very uh, kindly said, I'm Annette Walcock. And I'm head of food for the British Association for Shooting and Conservation. Uh, my job really is to encourage more people to eat game, uh, to support the game meat industry. Uh, that's the processors and the, even the little guys that have their market stall or sell straight into a pub and to encourage best practice throughout the supply chain. Um, but one of the biggest things that I have to do is to remind the shooting industry that actually game is a food. So I'm going to, this chap here is a red deer, um, a very handsome, I think he's, he's a bit iconic. It's probably the most recognized deer that most people know because um, uh, they always have such beautiful antlers as they get older. So, I'm going to the next one. So why British wild venison? Well, for a start, this, this chap on the, uh, lady or the chap on the right is a fallow deer. And uh, that's the one that uh, Curtis is working with and um, can often see, be seen in parklands. Uh, if you go for a nice uh, walk in, in the summer or something like that, then, um, you can um, often see those in, in, the, in a parkland. But like I say, why, why wild British venison? Because it really works really well with uh, seasonal ingredients. So root vegetables, autumn berries, um, and they can take really strong flavors because they're, they're such a strong meat. And, the, and it's ethical. It's probably the most sustainable meat um, it has no medication, it's 100% wild, it's not fed, and it, it's because it's wild, it's in, just incredibly ethical. Uh, it's great value, um, if, especially if you want to buy a whole carcass and uh, um, use the whole carcass within your um, res restaurant, then it's a really viable option. It's really good um, like I say, it's really good value. Customers will try it on its menu. We did some research. Um, we were at, we go to the BBC Good Food Show every year. And um, out of the 54% 54, 54 of the people at that show who saw us doing our demos on venison said they would try it in a restaurant. And we've done some consumer focus groups and they also highlighted that the uh, restaurant is often the first place they try game. So it, it's, it's really good for you to have you on your menus. People like to try it. And it's great to experiment with because it is such a, a strong meat. It can take loads of different flavors. So you can um, add something different to your menus um, by just experimenting with it and see what tastes, uh, uh, what ingredients go really well with it. So venison also ticks the key trends that the consumer is looking for in foods at the moment. So the first one is transparency. And you can ask your game dealer where it came from. Every uh, carcass will have a tag with it who will, and that tag will take it back to the stalker so you know exactly where it comes from. It's uh, the, the other area is ethical values. People want to know that their meat has come, has had a happy life. And because they're 100% wild, they do have a happy life. And people like to see that. And the third one is health and uh, wellness. Uh, game meat is extremely uh, healthy. It's very low in fat. It's very high in nutrients. And um, it's, it's uh, very high in iron. So it gives it that healthy aspect, very high in protein for those on the high protein diet as well.
so why why do why did why deer well for a start we must shoot them um, this one, this guy here is a Chinese water deer. You can see from his tusks. I don't know whether you can see his tusks there. Um, he's very unusual, very distinctive with, with his tusks. Um, and um, we must shoot them because we have 2 million of them in the country and they have no natural predators anymore. Uh, they did once we had lynx and wolves that would keep the numbers under control, but we don't have that anymore. And deer are, a, are of cultural and economic importance and a vital part of our heritage and absolutely stunning to look at. But we must uh, make sure that they don't overtake everything uh, because they do a huge amount of damage. And when they do that damage, nature doesn't flourish. They do damage to the countryside. They eat uh, a lot of plants and trees. Um, I've been to a wood that looked absolutely perfect from the outside, but everything un sort of under six foot was eaten. It was completely barren because the deer had been in there. And sadly, when we get a lot of population, they themselves starve. Um, they uh, don't have shelter and they don't have food because the population has got too big. And then you see uh, this, them starting to die of starvation. We have a huge amount of road accidents in this country. They say there's between 42,000 and 72,000 road accidents a year, um, which are caused by deer. So we do have to need, keep those numbers down. So, why wild over farmed? Well, farmed, uh, there's nothing wrong with farmed and uh, we're you know, quite happy for people to have farmed, but it's not as sustainable as uh, wild. They, they get medicated and they are fed as well an artificial diet. And most of the uh, farm venison in this country, especially the stuff that you see in the supermarkets actually comes from New Zealand. So it's carbon footprint is, is, is very big. So make sure it is British and wild venison that you put on your, your menus. Uh, we are, uh, uh, scoping out at the moment and working on a project to quality assure uh, wild British venison in this country with um, Grown in Britain. Grown in Britain is a sustainable tree brand and uh, we are working with them to make a provenance brand for British wild venison and a quality assurance scheme. Now this quality assurance scheme will also mean that the um, venison will come lead free. We're working uh, in the industry quite strongly to move away from lead within game. We um, announced it about or last year that we would be five years uh, in the transition, but actually the supermarkets are making sure that, that we are moving on that a lot, lot quicker. There's a lot of pressure for us to uh, produce the meat without the lead content now. So within a couple of years, I think you'll be seeing all gain meat without the lead content. Uh, we do a college project where we go into colleges uh, with all the different types of game, including venison. Uh, we do a deer butchery um, uh, demonstration and we show uh, all the different types of game you can get and how to prepare them and how to cook them. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, please let us know. Um, we ha also have the Eat Game Awards. The Eat Game Awards are uh, our awards that uh, showcase and um, uh, the innovative um, products that are now in um, game. And we have two, three categories there, uh, which will interest you. One is the best chef using game best restaurant and best pub. And uh, last year, best chef was won by Tom Kitchen. Um, and that we'll be launching those again in the autumn. So if you do use a lot of game, 
and you'd like to be um, nominated for that, go to the Eat Game Awards. And just lastly, we're doing um, some taste research. Nobody has really done much research between the species. Um, we have six species in this country and um, only two of them are actually native to this country, the red and the roe. Uh, what you've got here is a seeker deer, which is uh, originated from Japan. And he's very, they're very popular with chefs because they produce a very sweet meat. And it was all the rage about two or three years ago, everybody in London had seeker deer. Um, and uh, so what we're doing is getting some descriptive words to, so people can tell their customers what the difference between the meats are. Um, and that's been going, going on at the moment. And I will share that with the chef's forum when that's done so that you can use those and uh, to you know, and please put you know that it is uh, British wild venison on your menus put the species find out from your game dealer what species it is and put that on the, the menu as well so that we can educate the general public as to the type of venison they're actually eating and that's it from me Thank you, Annette. I think we, that was really fascinating. Um, and you've, you've had loads of interest from colleges, so you're going to get uh, lots of inquiries about your project. Great. That's, That's really great. good news. So I think we're heading back over to Curtis now. Are you staying with us, Annette, I take it? I am, yes. Yeah, brilliant. OK, so I'm sure there'll be some more questions. So recently, we... Um gathered at the larder, um, socially distant obviously, um, to arrange a couple of chef demos. This was pre-lockdown. Um, and so we invited Michael Nazero down to the larder um, to play around with um, Curtis's venison and he cooked a fantastic recipe. We also had um, a, a lovely sort of um, venison loin with a lovely jus. I think you'll see that in the video that we'll play in a little while. Um, and also Charlotte uh, Vincent, who's at the Five Bells at Fist Hyden, because uh, Curtis actually supplies a lot of local chefs directly and they love buying off him because he actually delivers in person. So he's bringing them in from the field, he's processing them in the larder, he's then breaking them down into the cuts the chefs want. And I think you've had some samples sent to you. Um, and it's this whole traceability element that the chefs really go for. Um, and in line with what Annette's just been presenting, you know, it's so important to be responsibly sourcing venison and making sure that you're buying from uh, reputable um, suppliers like Curtis. So are you back with us, Curtis? We've got Curtis. I hope we haven't lost the star. <laughs> no, where is he? But in the meantime, I think Alex, if you want to play the video, is he... Curtis, can you hear us? I can, yes. Sorry, we lost oh, you then. It's because you're in Devon, deepest, darkest Devon. That's why. It's not the best place for signal, I can assure you. <laughs> right. So we've got lots of colleges saying that they oh, want to no. get involved in Annette's um, college programme. So we will definitely facilitate that. We'll be working with Annette throughout the year to ensure that we're constantly raising our hands to the colleges um, and, and getting, getting involved. So what we'll do is we'll save the chat and everyone that's interested, we'll make sure we hook you right up with Annette. And in the meantime, let's get back to Curtis for you to carry on with your, your demo. Oh, are we doing the video next? Or should we do the demonstration? I think we do the video first, please. Leave that to Alex. My name's Curtis Pitts. I'm the director of Curtis Pitts Deer Services. As a third generation deer manager, with my grandfather harvesting deer before me from the land and my father, we now go out as a company and harvest wild deer from both our parklands and our wild environments up and down the country, looking to source the best quality venison we can provide. The 
Today is a great opportunity to explain to you guys the products that we harvest out in the wild. Our venison carcasses that we bring in from the field are a really important sustainable product that we harvest that need to be used and consumed by the general public. We, we take our carcasses in in the fur, we process them within our larder and skin them down into a clean carcass. Once we've skinned our carcass, we then have a clean carcass ready to break down into our primal cut. Our primal cuts are the basic clean cuts of a carcass that are really easy for a chef to then demonstrate and take away the muscle groups that they like to use. We then subtract the, the haunches, which are the first primal cut, the two rear legs. They're great for slow roasting joints and your steaks. We've then got the flanks and the trim, which is obviously a really good product for your mint. And then you've got your saddle and your shoulder. The saddle is broken down into your loins, which and fillets, which are obviously the, the prime cut of the carcass. And then your shoulders are also good for the dust. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Michael Nizero, I'm consultant chef. Here, I'm here today at Curtis Pit HQ to cook one of their fantastic venison and I hope you will enjoy the recipe. Yeah, well, autumn is my favorite season and I'm very excited today to come uh, with this recipe where we can have wild mushroom, fondant potato and obviously uh, venison. Venison which is uh, an amazing and healthy uh, lean meat. Not many of you know that but it's actually full of vitamins and it's very sustainable because uh, I mean look at look at where uh, the venison are and they just can feed and uh, forage whatever they want so it's great to promote this fantastic meat today. Uh, Curtis Piz has prepared, especially for this dish, a fantastic uh, piece of loin fillet. The first thing uh, I, I will be cooking today is the sauce. The sauce for me is very important, it's the base and this is what carries through the flavor of the dish. So I'm going to do, uh, use the, the trimming of the venison I got and I'm gonna finish the sauce with uh, mustard, grain mustard and digit mustard will, which will bring a kick to the dish and will really put forward this lovely uh, wild venison flavor. I've done this lovely brioche and nuts sellers macadamia nuts on top. I've done a crust and this works very well together because uh, you get the nuttiness of the macadamia but you also have the kick of the, of the mustard and the wildness flavor of the venison. So all in all, this dish will really perfectly together and I hope you enjoy that. What a great way to celebrate the great British game week by associating Curtis Piz Venison with a taste of game. I really enjoy being outside from a young age. I've always been someone that enjoys being outside in the woods and in the fields. I've got a massive connection and passion with the land and harvesting our products we get from outside. I'd much rather be out there than inside. Fantastic video there, I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, we, had, we had a lot of fun filming that as well. Um, it wasn't the warmest day. And, uh, it certainly wasn't. No, but Curtis seems to walk around in a t-shirt, whatever the, the uh, or a polo shirt, whatever the weather. I think he's being a man of the land. Used I to work it. in a fridge. He works in a fridge. So, you know, it's just great really having a chef like Michael Nazero. I mean, a lot of you will know who he is. Um, he is actually Rue trained. He was the executive sous chef at the um, Ritz. He more recently has been at the Bath Priory, um, executive chef there. And now he's done, you know, as all chefs who um, like to go on and then offer their sort of knowledge and skill set, he's a consultant now. Um, and so he's helping a lot of the food brands like we do, you know, and, and helping a lot of the, the chefs, you know, develop menus and offer his insight, really. Um, and so it was great to welcome him down to... Um, Curtis Pitts HQ to do some cooking. Um, so now back to your new larder, Curtis. I mean, we saw in the film, you've got the new rail system. It's a Fisher modular unit that you've got. It's his second one. Uh, why did you choose the current um, setup that you've got now, Curtis? 
We were very lucky back in 2017 um, when we set up the business in the way we did. We bought a small modular larder from Fisher that could hold or it could hold 25 carcasses to age for a time before we brought them out and skinned them in the only cutting room we had at that time. Um, over three years of having it, we, we luckily organically grew out of, out of that building. And this, this October, this, this modular building itself, which came in two parts, was delivered by Fisher UK. Um, and it's just massively um, increased our efficiency with handling carcasses, because as I'm sure some of you would know, these guys aren't always the lightest. We, we harvest red carcasses from the wild that can be up to well over in excess of 100 kilos. And although I'm only 24 at the moment, when I get a bit older, lifting 100 kilo carcasses around and hanging them up on a hook that's seven foot in the air is probably not going to be feasible or sensible. Um, so having this new rail system put in, which has an inline track scale system, so we can weigh our carcasses at different stages in the process, so we can start to gain a little bit more data and knowledge about what's happening where their hot weight when they come in in the skin, their cold weight in the skin, and then even their skinned weight. So we can see what lossage we have in moisture over the different times within the chiller um, and all that, all those elements of the processing of the carcass through the larder. Um, and it's, it's all, all in all, it's just increased our efficiency. We can now process 10 to 15 carcasses with only two of us in here a day to your, your, down to your steaks and your dice and your mints. So, from that aspect, it, it makes a huge difference. And the other thing that makes us more efficient is we now got the ability to store 60 carcasses in the fur to then bring out and skin on the days when they're ordered, which, which means we don't always have to be out and we can plan a week. So we've got half the week out in the field harvesting our carcasses and then half the week in here processing orders and dispatching orders to our customers. So it makes a huge difference handle every element of the business yourself i mean it's, it's really quite impressive um you come from a long line of deer managers but you personally set up this business while you're at university um and you're 24 now and you you know you're really doing so well you know you've you're growing you supply some of you know the finest kitchens around you supply some of the finest um tailors as well and you also sell direct you've got a full-on e-commerce shop um and, you know, we see your inquiries coming in and, and you are one popular guy, you know, I mean, you must feel quite proud, Curtis, you know, how things have gone. I'm, I'm certainly very lucky. My grandfather started harvesting deer at the age of 16, 17. He's now 84. And my father took it on after my grandfather. And they always processed and harvested deer from the wild and the wild alone and sold them direct into the game dealing market. I grew up with this, this industry and um, what my grandfather and father were doing and decided I wanted to take the processing of the carcass, the animal we harvest, um, a little bit further. So building a facility where we can ha ha um, hang these carcasses and age them and, and then cut them and, and sell them to initially, which was just the local pubs and restaurants um, is what we got licensed to do. And then we took it a bit further and got a bit more interest with wholesalers coming to us and different butchers and chains of butchers came to us and it's, it's organically grown. We've, we've been very lucky that we've got a very sustainable supply of wild fallow, roe, red and seeker. So we've got four, four species of the six down here in Devon and the surrounding counties. Um, and we, we can harvest these deer it, from the wild. We are also lucky that we have got some parkland environments as well, which you saw on that video. That was one of our, our red parks. Um, but we, we, we tend to use them for, I learn a lot from watching their behavior and watching them in the park and they, they come in for bigger contracts as such. So the, the, our bread and butter is our wild carcass and it's probably still 75 to 80% of the, the carcasses that we process. Um, I now believe I'm gonna give you a, a, a demonstration like in that video of skinning this wild fallow carcass down here and then taking it through to our processing room and cutting it into primals and the joints. So I'll carry on with that one. There's different elements to skinning a carcass and if I'm honest there's there's different ways of doing it and people do do it differently. Some people do it off the hook hanging like it is now and this carcass is currently on our rail system on our winch which you can see here above and it's all within 
within the winch system so we never have to lift the carcass from a handling point of view. So the winch comes down and the carcass also comes down into what we call our skinning cradle. Um, it's a device that holds holds the carcass and animal in a shape that favours favours being able to strip it in the most efficient efficient way. So we can bring the winch and block down, and then the winch goes back up out of out of the way to skin the carcass. Something like a little chest spreader like this is something we. Is, sorry, excuse the noise of the winch. This is what we call a chest spreader. It's something we put between the ribs of the carcass as soon as it comes into the chiller when it's hot from the field. And it just helps the carcass set in a shape that is more desirable for the saddle. So it, it, it spreads the ribs slightly. And as you can see now, I've taken the chest spreader out. The ribs are still spread apart about four inches. This holds the saddle shape and the loins in a slightly better manner, I believe personally, for when you produce a saddle for the kitchen or even um, a rack of venison as well, which we sell online. The other most important thing to know about every carcass we look at comes with a carcass tag. Our carcass tags still come from the British Deer Society. Um, and it gives every, everything is written on this tag the second the deer enters the larder from the estate it was shot on down to the date, the time, the weight it came in in a hot weight, the species and the sex of the animal. And it's all signed off by myself because I'm very lucky that we still um, harvest all the carcasses within house and don't, don't have any other stalkers involved. So I know exactly where the animal's fallen over and the process there. We're now gonna use what we call a, a tipped knife that's got a blunt tip, but it's got a sharp blade on top. And we can run this knife inside the skin, but without touching any of the meat the whole way down each side of the carcass and right out the rear leg and cutting from the inside out means that you don't actually cut any hair so you're cutting from the inside of the skin out to the hair which means you never actually cut any of the hair and create a, a hazard with that contamination inside the carcass in this position so once you've done both sides front leg to rear leg on both sides of the carcass down the side of the rib cage and back back out and then you just do two small incisions into the central area of the carcass which means we've then got the ability to grab this corner here and start peeling and undressing our, our fallow dough in this case whilst i do this i'm always cautious to make sure there's no no snagging of um snagging of the what we call the skirt on a beef carcass but in our case it's a slightly smaller skirt, you wouldn't see it as big. And you pull this right back through, past the, the front armpit as it were, and down past the foreleg. Do exactly the same the other side. Again, pulling this back through and past the armpit. You can now see guys, hopefully on the camera, that start of the flank and the ribs are starting to be exposed and we can start to see, see the actual clean meat underneath. We now remove the udder, which in this case was dry. So it's important. Another thing we we feel is important is if there's any areas that are suitable to leave the skin on, leave the skin on because it stops the drying out of the meat. If I'd remove the udder here, if it was if it was full, um, we would remove the udder because it would cause a contamination. But in this case, it was dry, so we left it on. So all these inside of the haunches here are not affected by the, the in the chiller and drying out. So this uh, still as fresh as they can be from that point of view. You just bring bring the legs back, back round so you expose, expose meat. If I'm honest, the less knife work you do at this stage, the better. You want to ease the skin off, preferably fully with your hands rather than a knife because it just stop snagging of the carcass. So from this point on, I try and use my fingers and my hands as much as possible. But the, and this does vary depending on the age of the deer as well. So an older animal of which this wild fallow doe here was probably three or four years old. She had two calves um, and she, she was a slightly older age. So her skin is always tougher to be removed than a younger 
yearling, which is your prime carcass, um, can, can be quite supple and the skin can pull off really easily. So I'm just removing the skin around the rear tendons now of this, this fallow doe. at the same time so <laughs> I will um just just to let you know um that the recipes will all be sent to you Michael Nazero's recipe uh, we've had Hayden Groves doing a chimichurri um wild venison haunch as well um and we could also send over the sensational um Benny Welly Benny, Benny Benison Wellington that um Charlotte made she used parma ham instead of like the pancake um, and it was probably the best thing I've ever tasted, I think. It was a freezing cold day and it was beautifully pink inside. It was needed, wasn't it? It was needed. It soon got demolished, though, by the crew, didn't it? It certainly did. Mm. What's, the, what's the best part of your job, do you reckon, Curtis? What's the best bit? I, I must say I've thoroughly enjoyed most aspects of the job, um, but being out in the wild and in the field and watching the deer has to still be a favourite and still does give me um, a, a buzz and a good feeling being out of seeing them, doing what they're doing and doing that process with them. Um, watching our hives grow from year on year is, is a, a massive element of my job. To, to be completely honest with you all, the venison side is a bit of a sideline to the actual gear management, which is where the business and where my grandfather and father started. Um, you know, looking after the herds of deer and managing their populations and population densities, is, as, as Annette said, we've got growing numbers of deer across the UK uh, and managing these populations for the natural ecosystems and environments around them is as important as anything else. Um, let alone harvesting the venison. So it, 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 there's, there's very much two, two elements to my job and always every week is a different element. So as we can see here, we've now just started to remove the, the rear, rear shanks and rear legs. So you can see they're de-skinned. And the most important thing here is now the carcass is suspended. As we pull the carcass off, we get clean skin on clean, clean side to the fur as it were, and the, the hair side always comes down away from the carcass. So if you've got any contamination from, unfortunately it was our wet, a wet day when the animal was harvested or the, the animal before it was harvested had been running around in the mud and the woods, that side of things can be removed away from the carcass rather than get contamination on the carcass. So again, we just have a slight fiddly bit here around the back end of the deer and that side of things to just make sure the, the skinning process comes away nicely and then it should, I say should, pull quite nicely. On, on, a, on a Monday morning, once we've had orders from a weekend, as I say, we can be doing 10 to 15 of these a day and we, we always skin them out first thing, get them through into our, our clean chiller as it were, and then we, we, we cut for the rest of the day. So it's, it's always a first thing in the morning job. So it's quite strange doing it at this time of day. And as you can see, I'm starting to, um, my elbows and my hands to knead the skin off around the animal and around the tailbone here and um, expose, expose the carcass. You just take a small incision across the tail through the fat, which you can see this doe has got probably 15 mil worth of fat around her tail. So she's in good condition. She's been foraging where she wants to forage. She's... Um, grazed whichever fields and whichever hedgerows she, she desired it during her life. And she's clearly, clearly done quite well for it. There's a nice, nice level of fat on her rear haunches there. And I believe as we, if we pull this skin down now, we'll um, start to see a nice layer of fat along her saddle and her back. So again, as I say, it's just a gentle, gentle pull, just dealing with the snags as they appear. Um, you know, when you compare this side of the process to a, an abattoir that's processing however many beef carcasses a week, they're all using robotic machinery and much larger machinery. And so are, so are all our, our farm deer that are being imported from New Zealand or even our British farmed deer 
go to um, some select abattoirs across the UK and they're actually skinned unit using machinery. So it's, it's nice to keep a human touch to this um, and get this pulling off in the way that we can watch and see what's going on and make sure it's happening the way we want it to do. Um, a lot of the delegates are asking what you do with the skins and I said you get them processed and you actually sell them to a lot of high-end interior designers, don't you? Um, yeah, we, we're very lucky that because of we, we harvest a lot of these fallow here, this one in particular isn't the prettiest, but you know there is the stigma of the spotty bambi. Um, wild fallow are, are that, that animal and we send a lot of our skins Unfortunately, at only certain times of the year, because there is a lot of periods of times where they're in a, a state of change of coat, so the skin would shed and wouldn't and wouldn't produce a very good a very good hide. Um, but when when we can, we we take these skins and we we actually unfortunately have we used to have to send them abroad because there isn't a tannery in the UK that likes dealing with venison hides, um, and they get cured down and sent back to us about six months later. And they do go to, as I say, we, we sell skins ourselves on our website. Um, and we, they also go into London and other desired areas for, for interior designers to make lots of different things, but from fire guards to um, clutch bags um, and all sorts of elements of different, different things. So it's, it's, it's always lovely to see what's created, which is with something that is essentially, unfortunately, a byproduct to what we do. Dan from uh, West London College is asking what you do with the whole heads. I mean, you do a roaring trade in ears, don't you? Sorry, I missed that, Catherine. Ivan was asking what you do with the heads and the antlers, the whole heads. Um, do you want to tell him about the taxidermy purposes that some of the elements of the park is created for? Yeah, so we, we, we honestly try and be as zero waste as possible. So all our, all our offals, so our hearts, livers and kidneys, all go, go into, um, we've got a walk-in freezer and they go out as well. A lot actually go out as fresh, but if we've got too many that week, they um, go, go into the freezer and they get sold on for people to enjoy at home um, in different aspects. Um, as, a, as a result of the way we harvest our carcasses, um, there isn't a lot left of the top section of the, the head. So the antlers get either cut up and get processed into the dog chew market. So there's a huge demand for um, antlers as dog chews, um, which has got a lot of different in, uh, chewing benefits to dogs for their teeth. Um, and we also have a, a, a few carcasses a year that are harvested that have um, rather desired heads that then, then go on to either interior designers to make candlesticks and other products along those lines or all the way through to different ornaments and chandeliers we've even seen made with some of our antlers and we're also lucky because we've got the parkland side of things on antlers that deer every 12 months shed their antlers so they naturally fall off they grow out um, and fall off and this then means we get a shed pair so a pair of antlers fall off individually and we can, they're, they're completely sustainable because they're grown every year. And we can collect these from our parklands and also pass them on to interior designers to process. So here we have it. This is our fallow doe completely skinned out. As I thought, she's got a nice covering of fat. You can feel the fat content just on the front of her haunches here before they join her saddles and her loins. You can also feel the fat build up in the rear of her flanks just here. So it's something I can feel for with the fur still on. So I can, you know, I have, just for example, we had a customer last week ask for a fattier venison carcass, which isn't always something that is possible with venison being a very lean meat. But we're lucky with our wild deer, they do grow a little bit of fat on them and we, would be able, we, we were able to provide that last week. So this carcass is very clean, um, all skinned out and ready to go into our processing room. So I did, we do some final inspections here. We check for any dirt um, or, just some, there's the few hair follicles that have fallen off in their process. And nine times out of 10, I always trim off just the sides of the rib meat here, just because it was that area that's possibly dried out slightly in the, in the chiller whilst it's been aging. So we take that off and that can go into our trim pile. 
and then the carcass moves forwards into our processing room. So I'll take you through into our processing room and show you the breakdown of this fallow dough. Now, so it's great to see the Kurdish cells in fact use the whole animal. I mean, this week we've been inundated with orders for offal for haggis. People want to make their own venison haggis, and you know, they've been asking for hearts and, and liver and kidneys. Um, we've got that recipe going on to the site. If you look on Curtis's website, you'll see all the different chef recipes and, and some really quite innovative ways in which you know people are cooking with game meat, um, in general as well as venison. So we're in the processing room now. You are indeed. So that's, a, that's the major difference with this rail system that's in the sky. We've moved about 10 metres down the rail and through two doorways. And we're now next to one of our cutting stations where we can hang this carcass here and cut all our primals off it without having to lie it down on a table or bear any weight from the product at all. So we can, we can now start to process this carcass and take, take the primal elements off. So initially, I always remove the flanks and the skirt here, so it opens up the carcass and I can see what I'm dealing with. So we'll, we'll do that first. And what I'll do, guys, is I'll remove everything off the carcass whilst it's hung here and put it on our chopping table to one side, and then we'll move the camera across and we'll go through the primal sections. So initially, as I say, inside the pelvis here, and be mindful not to catch the haunches. And we come down and we grab that fatty node in there and just take this skirt right off, right back down to the rib cage, and then bring it out along the ribs and down. And then we've got one section of skirt there, and we can do exactly the same on the other side and remove those two skirts. Um, this obviously depends on the products that you're producing. So if we're producing a boned and rolled saddle or a rack of venison, I tend to leave the skirts on the saddle um, until I've got the saddle on the table, and then I can trim them to the desired length for, for the customer and, and the product required. Um, we're now going to take off the shoulders. It's best to have the carcass facing straight at you, and you essentially take your knife and go inside the armpit and cut up across, across the animal's rib cage, um, following the bone up, and that way you end up going inside the shoulder blade and the shoulder naturally peels off because there's actually no adjoining ball and socket joint or anything like that in here. It's just held on by muscles. So as you can see, that's, that shoulder's just fallen off there. It's um, just held on with a bit of meat now. So we just run this back up the neck and take that off. And you've got one, one venison shoulder ready to be broken down and processed. So I'll do the same on the other side and then we'll have both our shoulders off and ready to cut. Just run inside the mid ribs, front of the neck, inside the shoulder blade, and back, back down to the neck fillet, and peel that off. And it will just hang there, and you can use the weight of the meat, in this case, to pull the products down, and it will fall off. So that's both shoulders subtracted from the carcass now. So we've got the ribs, which can be left long for a saddle or can be left short for a saddle, depending on what the chef desires to come to his kitchen. Um, in this case, for this carcass, we're probably going to strip the saddle down to the loins and add the loins to our six ounce loin steaks for stock. So I follow that line down with a knife and cut two nice lines for the bandsaw to follow, cut that off. And we also, at this point, take the neck off at the front of the saddle so I can then remove the neck of it. So we basically taking the animal back down for then the saw to go through. So in this case, I'll use the hand saw. Um, the neck goes through that front vertebrae there. And then, then that's the neck back off. And again, using the weight of the neck to pull itself down. And then you can just finish the, finish the cut off with your knife against the ribs. I'm quite long the whole way through on that one. And then we have one neck, which has got two substantial neck fillets on the back of it, and then all good quality trim for making our sausages and our burgers. So that can go onto the pile. Now I always take off the ribs from the outside, cutting in, so I can see where I'm going 
in relation to the saddle. So I'll follow that line down with the sword. So there's one, one flank and one rib. And we'll do the same on the other side. I always have to have a nice sharp blade on the sword to do that as well. Before we take the saddle off, we've got to remove our two pencil fillets that are in here, which you can actually see at the moment are fairly well encased with fat. So if we run down straight down the middle along the spine and get our flexible knife get in underneath the pencil fillets, and again follow the ribs out, you're not having any meat damage, and you're purely just running across the carcass. And you can remove that, slide up inside the haunch, and encased in that fat that that doe had on her is your, is your pencil filler. So I then peel that fat off, and in there, you can slightly more see it now, is a pencil filler against the fat that was encased in it. So chefs are going absolutely crazy for these pencil fillets at the moment. There are only two per carcass. Um, and they are the equivalent, would you say, to the filet mignon, would you, Curtis? Yeah, they're, they're definitely the most tender and supple part of the whole venison carcass because they're the, the least used muscle group on the body being in, inside the spine here, above the rib cage, and just before the pelvis. There's not a lot of activity going on from the deer in that in that element. So they're, they're very, very popular. And as I say, as Catherine says rather, there are there are only two of them. And th this one we've just taken off here only comes in uh, 150 grams exactly. So there's there's not a lot of weight even before we trimmed it further. So now we've removed the two pencil fillets, we can take our saddle off. Um, there's always a discussion with chefs on how long they'd like their saddle. Um, to make sure that they're, they're not wasting wasting um, money on on poorer quality neck neck fillet or loin at the front, and that we don't cut it too far back into our haunches. So I've cut this one fairly long because I'm taking the loins off myself, and we can trim off the front of the loins to go into either dice or stewing meat. In this case, then we take just in front of the horn um, haunches, and we saw in here. And take that saddle off. So there we have our venison saddle with a nice eye of meat both ends. Um, as I say, three, four year old wild fallow doe. She's produced probably a 10 mil layer of fat there on her back on top of your loins. So this, this joint itself here could easily be boned out and rolled if we'd left the skirt on and flank on or it could, and, and then stuffed with any product. We ran a product over Christmas where this was stuffed with a um, cranberry and fruity stuffing um, but at the same time it can also be also can be deboned and turned into our, our clean loin six ounce steaks for um, pan frying at home so there's our saddle we'll put that onto one side and then all we've got left of this carcass now are its two haunches so here you've got the two haunches still got the shanks on because they're hanging on our gambrel to keep the carcass suspended the best bet to to do this again is using using the weight of the animal. So we actually now at this point lift it off the gambrel and hang it on one hook on its own on one leg. This means that this this leg here naturally falls falls away from the pelvis. So we can cut in in the center of the pelvis, producing a nice clean cut, and the haunches falling away from the animal. We can trace the pelvis right back around to our ball and socket joint where you can just go in and nick the tendon and that tendon falls back. And we can just trace this all the way back through now. Um, and it, as I say, you need a nice flexible knife to get in round all of these, these joints in here. And that can come off just like that. And then we have one venison haunch removed from the pelvis um, and all it's now got in it is its leg bone down to its shank and we'll take the shank off on the chopping block and I'll show you how to do that. So just do the same, same with the other horn, slightly different now because we haven't got the weight of a leg pulling it off. So you actually have to hold, hold the pelvis with your hand and give it a little bit of uh, that force downwards to um, aid, aid it easing off, which isn't a problem because it actually doesn't take 
much to come back off this. We've got a few questions coming in on the chat for you. Um, what is your favourite cut of, of, of venison? What's my favourite cut? Yeah. Um, if I'm completely honest, I absolutely love a stew or a casserole. So some nice diced venison from, from our haunches is, 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 always, is always a nice, warm, filling treat during the week. Um, but the, 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 a treat for myself, as it were, would have to be our six ounce loin steaks, completely removed of sinew in the pan with a bit of garlic butter. And, you know, even if it's, it's uh, served with just some chips and peas, is, is certainly a, ma a massive um, a treat in the flavours you can get through across the four species that we're lucky enough to har harvest. Uh, as Annette said earlier on, seeker deer certainly have a sweeter flavour, um, but the fallow, I must say, always have a good all-round fa flavour with, with their different varieties of what they're eating. And it's quite interesting, we actually harvest some fallow deer from an, a local orchard and that they spend the whole summer and autumn stealing the apples and that sort of stuff. And you can definitely taste that flavor coming through in the more tender cuts, such as the pencil fillets um, and the loin. And, and to be honest, even when you, you slow roast a shank from one of those fallow, you, you can, there's some amazing flavors that come through them. So if I now bring you down onto our chopping table um, and you can see the elements of the carcass laid out here in, 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 in in a format okay so we've got we've got our, our two our two ribs and flanks here closest um we've then got our two haunches with the shanks still attached our venison saddle with pencil fillets still underneath it and then the two shoulders and and the neck okay so everything's on the table to be processed and cut down so i'll leave the other primal sections alone and we'll just have a look at the haunches today because that's where our six ounce haunch steak comes from. So here is one, one of the haunches. The first job I always do is remove the shank. So on the kneecap here, one third of the way down from the top, if you just slice your knife into there and press the leg back using again, the weight of the weight of the meat, it actually just opens up and you can get inside to a tendon and break the shank off. It's a fantastic way of um, compartmentalizing and taking the carcass to bits without using a saw and creating bone dust and other elements like that. You can now take your, your venison haunch and your shank. In this case, it's quite a nice size shank. This shank, before we've taken off the rear tendon here, which we take off just at the base of the muscle, and then we always slice around here and cut them off with the bone saw. So you've got a nice clean, clean shank for dressing for the table um, and as I say slow roasting one of these and enjoying one of these at home is always is always a treat with a nice nice muscly eye like that and that shank off that wild fallow dough comes in at 668 grams so it's, it's, a, it's a good weight and it's a substantial meal for two in my opinion. Back to our venison haunch so this haunch now has been removed from the pelvis some butchers and some um, game larders leave the pelvis on and just cut the pelvis in half um, to me, it's better to remove the pelvis and expose the meat, and you can then see our different layers of sinew, and there is actually a node in here on top, which is a, a, a something we always have to remove, so it's important to see that. From this point of view, we're just going to break this um, um, haunch down into muscle groups to keep it as simple as possible, and run, run our knife back down the length of the, the femur here, and take out Take out this bone so it's, it's, well, it's boneless. Have we got any more questions as we're going, Catherine? I'm going to yeah. put. Curtis, I'm I've got one. How, how, oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just. Going I was just, to... just going to ask you. How old were you when you first uh, worked on your first carcass? I'm completely honest. That's a very good question, and I can always remember. Um, being sat in a car seat in the back of my father's pickup truck and dad had been out and harvested harvested a fallow actually I believe it was a row carcass at the time he'd been out and harvested a row carcass um, and and they we drove out into the field to collect the collect the carcass in the back of the truck I can always remember getting out as probably 
a toddler at that age and standing over dad whilst he, he did the field gralloping and removed the stomach and did the field inspection and just seeing that. And from then on, it's always been pro, um, always been then. I, and I started with my rifle skills from harvesting um, wild rabbits and our, our Devon, Devon rabbit out and doing that side of stuff because we do a lot with the rabbits. And then that progressed into the deer. And I think I, I harvested my first deer when I was 14 under supervision. So it is developed from there. Brilliant. Curtis, I'm just going to introduce you to Gavin from um, Colleague Gwent. Gavin, if you could put your mic off, please. Um, so Gavin's the reason why we introduced an element of butchery into this CPD um, conference. Um, because Gavin emailed me and said, is it possible to spend a day with one of your butchers? Because we, we deal with a few um, around and about. And um, but that was before we all got locked down. And I said, yeah, no problem. I'll sort that out for you. Um, so, Gavin, how are you finding this in terms of a CPD opportunity? Oh, this, this is absolutely amazing. Um, my, my one question I wanted to ask you really was, um, how much would it cost for the whole deer and then to have your butcher down to, to the pieces that you're doing now? Um, from a retail point of view, we sell a whole carcass. We sell three whole carcasses on our website, on our online shop, a 15 kilo row, a 20, um, 20 kilo fallow and a 25 kilo fallow. They're sold at £5.50 a kilo and that's fully butchered into any cut that you require with additional costs for sausages and burgers because they get 20% pork in them. So from, from, a, from a retail point of view, it's £5.50 a kilo. And then our, our, our wholesale price that goes into the into a kitchen is a is a whole carcass. So as you saw it when we skinned it in our skinning room, that goes out at four pounds fifty a kilo. Wow, and carcasses vary in weight. Oh, thank Brilliant. you very much for that. No we, worries. Um, somebody asking, what's your preferred knife brand to work with? And it's quite interesting they should talk about knives because you're actually bringing out your own knives, aren't you? We certainly are. Yeah, we're talking to Flint and Flame at the moment about doing. Uh, a, a few different knives with our butcher academy that we're, we're, where we're going to be doing when things permit and we're allowed people to come into the larder with us and have a one-on-one -on -one session on learning how to break down a carcass um, but I must say in the larder for a knife that we use and abuse um, and gets get you know it, it does the job we require we currently use the Victoria Knox flexible um, filleting and um, boning knives they're great for following the bones of the carcass and going around the separate muscle groups. And to be honest, they're, they're at a price where we can purchase the knife, use it, and then when it's it's worn out, we can purchase a new one without worrying. Yeah, and so you are, as part of your butchery academy that you're launching, as soon as we're allowed to actually invite people to the larder, you're giving them a nice branded apron, you're giving them... Um, lovely cuts to take home with them you're giving them one of your entry level knives the victoria knox knives and then also you're giving them a, a percentage off uh meat for sort of six months after that so they can yeah, practice, yeah, their skills to practice their craft yeah the, to me the most important part of what we do is making this sustainable product available to all um we i i personally feel we try and price ourselves so the stigma of being a high-end expensive meat is hopefully, certainly in our sausages and our burgers and our diced and our mints, is we're, we're quite frankly cheaper than your high street beef equivalent from the butcher's shop. So it's something that we want to make this product that's sustainable. And quite frankly, here in the UK, we've got plenty of in abundance available to the consumer to, to enjoy and, and taste and try in a lot of cases. A lot of cases we find that a lot of our online consumers are first time buyers or they, they've, they've had a, they've been gifted something or they've tried something before from the local stalker and it's possibly not been handled in the, the correct manner. Because from my point of view, the most important part to get this, this product back to the larder is from when it falls over in the field to when it's hung up and its carcass tag goes on. That's which, that's the area of time that changes the taste and the quality of how, how this is handled and treated. Brilliant. So, I mean, I think next on from this, we are going to be arranging a full day of, of butchery with Curtis. So whether we do that in per person or whether we do it um, 
virtually remains to be seen, but also to bring Annette, Annette in to talk about other species of game. Uh, because there's a plethora, isn't there, Annette? If you can just take your mic off a minute, please. Sorry, you're breaking up a bit. Oh, sorry. Just because I'm in deepest, darkest Somerset, the next county <laughs> alone. Um, yeah, so um, basically, um, I was saying that there's a plethora of different game species that we could cover in butchery and also sourcing and traceability and provenance and conservation. Um, so much so that we're actually producing a guide at the moment and we're working with both Curtis and Annette and all the chefs of the Chefs Forum uh, to produce a fantastic um, guide to the best game chefs in the UK. So if you know any that are absolutely banging game chefs, let me know and we'll make sure they're in included. But Annette, you know, what other species could we include in future courses? Well, there's there's the game birds. So you've got your your partridge and uh, your pheasant, which are the most common ones. But then you've got the smaller birds like the woodcock and the snipe. Um, and then you've got your ducks, all different types of ducks, your teals and your mallards and that sort of thing. And you've got your, uh, your what we call pests, which are your rabbits and your hares and your pigeons, uh, and, as well as your venison. So, yeah, quite a range. So we could keep them busy for quite a while, couldn't we, Annette, really? We could, yeah. <laughs> but then we can also get chefs to actually join us in a field kitchen and demonstrate some recipes with those ducks. You know, so obviously, butcher chef, butcher chef, you know, and, and you know, provenance. And we, we'll do the whole gamut of stuff. So that's what we plan to do with this sector of the CPD. So back to Curtis, please, Curtis, you, what are you doing now? No worries. So we've, we've got this one haunch now. It's broken down into the three major muscle groups. So when, if we try and look at this like you would a beef carcass, you've got your top side, your silver size and your rump. So you've got your different elements, which we, we personally find this is, we're lucky enough to have fallow that produce good muscle groups and reds that produce good muscle groups. So we can, we can harvest a six ounce steak out of these, no problem at all. Um, and then with our red carcasses, we can push an eight ounce to 10 ounce haunch steak from these muscle groups. With, with no no problem. Um, so, and all the off cuts from this can either go into our diced, our trim, or our, our, our mincing products. So there's a whole range of things you can get from this. And we can also, that, that's a that's probably 120, you know, what, what, what weight is that? That's a 750 gram roasting joint. It can be a bonus haunts roasting joint. We could tie that up and dress it up and send it out as is, and it would be a lovely meal for probably a family of four. Um, and the rest are all great for cutting into your steaks and dice. So what we're going to do now is we're going to just cut a couple of these into our haunch steaks to show you what can, can be produced. Another good thing from yesterday, Curtis, is I just got a message through from somebody who was on Hayden's um, macadamia session yesterday. And this morning, he actually cooked the um, savoury macadamia granola with the venison haunch for his students. He shared it with his students this morning. Um, so you're, you're making a difference without even realising it. You know, that shows how CPD can be directly then translated into inspiring the students, you know, from what you've learned on this course, which is absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. So here, here we have, as you can see, four haunch steaks that I've just cut from that silver side there of the carcass. You can see there's a small layer of fat from that dough. Um, as Annette will probably tell you, venison fat, if treated incorrectly, can be very tacky and waxy in the mouth. Um, so if I'm honest with most of our cuts, um, we send steaks out with the fat removed. So it's all clean and easy to put straight in the pan. But we also do, if required with certain chefs, um, send them out to add, add flavor to the carcass and then that steak there can go and be enjoyed on, on a plate. Curtis, um, can I just ask, what did you do at university? You said you went to university earlier. Yeah, I did. I went to the Royal Agricultural Uni up in Sirencester and did a degree in rural land management. So actually training to be a chartered surveyor. Um, something I was very interested to, in at the time, having had this as a sideline business. Um, but it was amazing how going to uni for three years and getting a degree in land management gives me the different skills with valuation, 
um, and the ecosystem and looking after our landowners with the many estates we deal with to harvest their wild animals, having that ability to understand a little bit of valuation on crop damage and impact surveys and different tree impact assessments and census work is something we spend a lot of time doing in the summer because of course this is a seasonal product we have three months in the summer where we can only harvest a few species and they're the smaller species so we we tend to shut down because i love the the seasonality of our products so i would never want to push it out of season as a frozen product i love keeping it fresh and seasonal mm -hmm. so we we kind of close down the the larder from a mass venison processing and just do some of our of our, our rabbits and smaller species of deer um, and we and we then go out and do a lot of reports and work from that so that that's come i suppose really from my university degree in in doing valuation and the legal side of um tenders for stalking and dealing with different stalking commissions and stuff like that that's brilliant it's re really interesting i'm so pleased that it all comes together um and it, i think everybody agree, will agree you've got an absolutely fascinating job and you do it excellently and with absolute abundance of passion so i think I've, everybody's going to congratulate you the chat's coming through with you know, practically everybody's saying, sign me up, sign me up. How do I get involved? So uh, you're going to be very, very busy and a, a sought after man. I'll look forward to reading that one later because I can't quite see it from here. But it, yeah. it, I must say that, that I would never call. I'm very lucky um, to say this. This is hardly a job for me. It's definitely a passion. Um, I, was, I was always into both my grandparents are farmers. Both farms have wild deer on them from Red and Fallow in mid Devon and down in South Devon. Um, and I've always enjoyed being outside and the, the side of things from looking at the crop damage and the tree impacts for the Forestry Commission and the effects deer, deer and other wildlife rabbits have a huge impact on, on cropping and the arable enterprises across the UK. But the deer, unfortunately, have a greater, greater damage and destruction to both tree plantations and, and arable cropping and even grass and grazing, you know. We can compare a, a fallow, a mature fallow deer to the same grazing rate and speed as a, a, a mature sheep. So when, you, when you're looking at a wild population of 30 deer in a, in a field, Mr. Farmer is always giving me a call to let me know. That's brilliant. In, terms um, of, in, in terms of your cuts and, you know, in terms of the demo, are we, are we finished? Have we got some more cuts to do? Uh, well, we're broken down to our, our six ounce haunch steak. So that's as far as I can go if that's desired. But if we would like to look at something else and someone else would like to look at a different cut, I'm, I'm more than happy. Well, we will do, but we'll do that another day. And I'd just like to invite some questions by uh, Neil. Neil, do you want to take some questions from the chefs? Yeah, to, for the participants. Yes, let's please. Have a look what, let's have a look at what we've got. So... Um, Sorry, I've, I've kept a little bit of an eye on the chat. I'm just, I think you've asked most of them. Is there, is there anybody that wants to um, jump in now? Any, any of the participants? Let's have a look, see if anybody's raised their hands. Oh, look, Gavin's got to go now, otherwise he'd keep his hand up all day because I think he was absolutely riveted. Um, this, this has been amazing. I gotta say, um, I do have to go, unfortunately, but you, your, your, your whole talking through the whole how you cut it down each part of the of the knife cuts that you that you're um talking about you can see that you're really really enthusiastic about it you can see the passion and it certainly comes through and you're, you're quite delicate with it as well there's no sort of rushing through it you, you your knife skills are awesome so thank you so much this has been um very very informative brilliant no it's wonderful i mean i think today's shown us that there's an absolute massive um, desire for this kind of um, CPD. We will definitely work with Annette and Curtis to ensure that we're ticking all those boxes for you. And in turn, when the students are allowed to do visits, you know, they can come and have a look at the larder. I've been talking to Paul Bentley from uh, from uh, Strode College, haven't I, Paul? Because you're not too far away, are you? No, very close. Uh, I'm so extremely excited if we can get down there. Uh, and that is all the way, if, if I can, from the stalk all the way through. Uh, I'd like to start, do that process. Um, excellent. 
presentation today was great. And I've just added that bit. The sample you sent up the other night, I sort of had that the other night, uh, the other day. I had it last night, but uh, like you said, cooked it real sort of simple, nice hot pan. As I've turned it over, then I seasoned a bit of garlic and butter in there. Uh, and just, yeah, easy. It didn't even hit the plate. Seriously. <laughs> I've, I've booked mine in for tomorrow night. So uh, I'll let you know. That was booked in Saturday night treat. So uh, I'll let you know, Curtis, how it goes. Fantastic. Well, all, all of those steaks that went out from us on Tuesday afternoon that have hopefully reached you guys yesterday, Wednesday, sorry, um, were all from the fallow, fallow carcasses. They actually came from three different fallow carcasses to get the volume of steaks we needed for, for, for you guys to enjoy. So they were, they're all fallow. They're, they're, they're all, um, they're actually from a mature, uh, mature three mature yearling um, female carcasses. So they're again, three to four years in age. So they're not your yearling um, prime cut, but they're a, a three, three to four year old um, female carcass that was hung in the larder for actually 10 days. They're all hung for 10 days. So they've got a little bit more about them. Yes, I mean, if we, if, if um, the um, delegates would like to actually buy some more venison, you, you can buy it online. It's uh, www.curtispitsairservices.co.uk, isn't it? It is indeed. Yeah. yeah, well, I've got to say congratulations, Curtis. Um, we've, we've had a, you know, a challenging, um, challenging time lately, all of us, the whole world, obviously. We really have. Um, and it was, you know, to put on a virtual conference was, um, you know, for the first time, a little bit of a challenge and, and we, we were slightly nervous about how it would go. Um, but I think it's, it's been excellent to have so many different uh, views of the industry um, from sort of sugar to macadamia to, you know, some of the topics that uh, are challenging um, educators in, in hospitality colleges. Um, but I've got to say, you've rounded the uh, conference off absolutely perfectly with a really, really informative, highly professional, engaging um, presentation. And I know I'm speaking on behalf of everybody. When you get to look at the chat, pour yourself a nice drink and, and enjoy the compliments because um, you thoroughly deserved it. So I'm going to give you a little round of applause. So I think that's a, a virtual round of applause, Curtis. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much to everyone that's um, come along to watch. It, to be honest, it's a pleasure to show you guys what we, what we do in our process and if only I could get you out into the field and show you all the deer in their their natural habitat and in the wild and and show you that side of things because there's there's so many stigmas around around that and it's it's to me it's a special part of the the whole process and it, it's where this comes from at the end of the day and knowing where your product comes from whether it's on your menu in a in a restaurant or whether it's just on your plate at home I think is an important part of the story for you all to enjoy. Yeah. So to round off the conference then, uh, Neil, um, we'll be sending out evaluation forms, won't we, next week? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so, we, so uh, you, sorry, sorry Catherine, you go. go. <laughs> no, you go, go on. <laughs> oh, all right then. Um, so, um, we'll be sent, thank you so much for participating. It's wonderful um, to see so many of you so engaged and benefiting from the fantastic sessions that Neil's put together um you know all of our experts you know I've received while I've been on the call three thank you emails from various different speakers that we've had saying how great it's been for them as well so you've really kind of cheered them up of what is kind of a difficult time for everybody and to see this level of interest and engagement in their craft and their work and them as an individual is just so ins inspirational and so rewarding I think more than anything else um, it's certainly rewarding for us. We've loved having you and we certainly will be back with more events. And in the um, evaluation, we've asked you what you'd like to see more of, whether it's beer tasting, yes, please, or wine tasting or, you know, more, more sort of um, academic topics, hot topics. I know the maths and English was, went off on fire when you were discussing about maths and English being incorporated into the curriculum, business studies, um, you let us know when we will create these uh, opportunities and platforms for you um, and hook you and your students up with the relevant industry professionals. Neil's on board. Neil's managing the whole educational offer. Um, and then obviously uh, through the Chef's Forum, we're bringing brands 
you know, like Rationale, Adande, we've got um, lots of different producers, suppliers that would be more than happy to work with your students to enrich their learning and offer you guys trips and visits when, please, we're allowed to go out on them again, you know, so it's uh, um, great to see you all. And Neil, to sum things up. Yeah, absolutely agree, 100%. And I just want to say thanks to Annette as well, because your, your input, Annette, was, um, was highly interesting. So thanks to Annette for, for that. But no, I've really enjoyed it. Um, it's, been a great, um, it's been a great couple of weeks. I think it's really broken up um, you know, the, the, the week, some, something to look forward to, and um, lots and lots of interesting, engaging um, information and, and uh, demonstrations. And yeah, we'll just uh, we'll do whatever we can to um, to make the next one as equally as uh, inspiring and enjoyable. But we'll take uh, take the feedback from everybody and um, design it with your needs and uh, desires in place. I'm up for the beer tasting, wine tasting, venison mm -hmm. tasting, and everything else. So, thank you, everybody. Fantastic. Have a lovely weekend, and we'll see you soon. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 And have something to Curtis. I think he might have gone. Oh no, do you still? Yeah, he's here. He's here. Yes. Okay. Go for it, Ivan. Can you hear me, Curtis? I can indeed. Yeah, a silly question, but you were talking about the guts when you were watching your dad, you know, gutting the um, the animal outside. What What do you do with that? Do you leave them for the for for the scavengers? Um. So when when we do a what we call a green relic, that's the Food, food bag as it were in the stomach and then the large intestine, the lower intestine all the way back to the, the um, feces cavity going back, back through the pelvis. That comes out in the field in a suspended manner so it falls out of the carcass again using the weight of the product to come out of the carcass and it's hygienically suspended off, the, off essentially the field or the woodland floor. Um, we actually harvest the tripe which is the stomach so that, that tripe is then brought back and we actually have a few customers and well, we have quite a range of customers that are interested in tripe. And all we do is empty the tripe out in the field and then we wash the tripe out with clean, clean, fresh water from the farm here and backpack it down to send out to those customers to further process. The, as, as you say, the, the lower intestine all the way through to the um, entrails actually do in some cases get left in, left in the field for um, as you say, scavengers, foxes, etc., to enjoy, and they're discreetly placed in places so they're out of the eye, or also in in our parkland habitats, or in areas where it wouldn't be sensible or desirable to leave objects like that. They come back to the larder, and they're bagged and tagged, and they go into our um, incineration process, essentially, and go with all our other our other waste. But as I say, we're that the 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 feet and the head are about all we try and throw away. All the bones are kept for stock bones for our chefs. Um, the offal is kept. Um, we're sending lungs and livers and hearts out this weekend for haggis for Monday, for Burns Night. And ev everything we do, we try and use because we've harvested this amazing animal and we want to put it on a plate somewhere. So you, you're treating the, the venison like if they were pigs. There's nothing yeah, that, yeah. that goes to waste. That's good. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank no you. Worries. Okay. Has anyone else got a burning question? Or are we all going to jump on the full day course next time? <laughs> Sorry, can I, can I just ask a quick question? Um, You've you, you just been mentioning, um, you just been mentioning the uh, haggis. Yes. Uh, is there a retailer that sells this haggis? I made from your dear, uh, um, what we're, we're, we've actually produced a recipe with a gentleman um, this week that Catherine can tell you more about, but we've, we've got the products to then send out to produce a haggis at home. Yeah, so we, ha we have those products available. What? Right, okay, thank you. I've heard you're quite a good chef I've anyway. Um, I, reckon, I, reckon, I reckon you could nail that recipe. <laughs> Um, I've not actually made haggis before. Um, I have it every burn site. I celebrate burn site. It's my birthday the day before, but I, I think I'll have a go at this. And the whiskey is having. Oh, I've got the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful, guys. Well, I think we're going to love you and leave you. Right. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Um, yeah. And have a wonderful yeah. weekend. Thank you so much for joining us.
Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Bye bye. Curtis, great job. Cheers. Thank bye bye. You. Have a good weekend.